Well, it's time for Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And by the way, I hope you had a great Fourth of July. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to take up a bunch of important subjects. How about Pennsylvania's energy dilemma? But first, two Capitol reporters are going to take on a series of important subjects for all of us to be connected with. And we'll do that after these words. Welcome to the fast-paced and unrehearsed weekly discussion featuring the leaders who help shape your world. Join us as we address the issues that impact you each and every day. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. All right, well, we're going to take up a bunch of important subjects, and joining me to do that is Tom Lehman. He's the Capitol Reporter with WGAL. News 8, and Jim Murphy, she's the Capitol reporter with Penn Live Patriot News. All right, Biden's, deb uh, Biden's debate, Pennsylvania Democrats respond. Take it. Uh, well, Terry, obviously a lot of focus was you know, put on the president's debate. A lot of people saying that uh, he didn't have a great performance, but one of the things that did uh, occur the day after is a lot of Pennsylvania Democrats sort of came to his defense. Uh, yeah. In particular, Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro made the early rounds on some of the talk shows saying, you know, it was a bad performance, it wasn't great, but he also turned it uh, in light of the election between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, the Republican and former president, and said, listen, we've got a clear choice here. And if you There's are no doubt about that, right? And if you're voting in this election, Shapiro's point was you're not voting uh, based off of a debate performance. Potentially, you're voting off of who you think is going to be the better person to yeah. lead the country. Yeah. Now, Joe Biden spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania. He was born in Scranton, and he's traveled frequently through here when he was a U.S. senator from Delaware. I thought he lived in Pennsylvania. How often was he here, right? Oh, yeah. He's—I mean, particularly in the Philadelphia area, he's been yeah. there a lot this year. And I think even uh, today, or this being Sunday, um, he's supposed to be down there again. Yeah, Pennsylvania is important to Biden. Yeah. Well, it's important to both candidates, but you're absolutely right. This is a critical uh, battleground state for him. And as uh, we all know, I mean, I remember when he was a U.S. senator from Delaware, I thought he still lived in Scranton because how often he traveled throughout the state, back and forth and up and down, and he knows the state of Pennsylvania quite well. I'm just pointing out that he has these Pennsylvania roots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he certainly does, and I think he's— uh you know, when you see him on the campaign trail right now, I think he's certainly uh, trying to play to some of those roots, too. And, and the fact that he is somebody from this region, he's somebody who uh, identifies with a lot of the people here. And I think he's been trying to use that uh, in a way to help give himself a little bit more momentum against uh, Donald Trump, the former president and Republican candidate who he's facing off with in November. All right, we also have uh, on to another topic. We also have uh, a pilot out, and it's referred to as the student cell phone ban. What's that about? Well, this is a proposal that Senator Ryan Ahman has put on the table, and it's to run a two year pilot to see. You know, the impact on student behavior and academic performance if you take kids' cell phones away from them during the school day. And, you know, clearly the U.S. Surgeon General has said that um, so social media is having a very Who could negative live without their cell phones, right? <laughs> <I guess some laughs> You're all learn. agreeing with that. Some kids might have a chance to learn what that's about. But, yeah, I mean, they, the impact that, you know, the, the Surgeon General and, and so many studies have shown that, you know, kids are like either constantly on their phones. And, you know, the the uh, bullying and, uh, like, yeah, lowering self-esteem on, you know, just from the, what they're seeing on social media. So they they think, that's you know, point. other states have actually put this into law. So it's—but we're just talking about a two-year pilot. Yeah. yeah and what, I think the key thing here is that uh, the pilot, at least as I understand it, is schools would be able to take advantage of some grant money to buy what are essentially these little lockable bags. And so students would play— the cell phone into the bag at the beginning of the school day. Uh, well, I don't know if it goes into the locker or if they have it with them, but the bottom line is uh, they're not supposed to open these bags until the end of the school anyway. day. All right, let's run to a break. When we come back, I want to talk about expanding happy hour. What that? What's that all about? We'll get to that subject and more after these words. 
This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania State Education Association, bringing the power of a great education to our schools, our students, and our communities. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. All right, many of the big issues before the Pennsylvania State Legislature uh, can't really be dealt with until the state adopts, meaning the legislature adopts and the governor signs a state budget. Am I right about that? Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, you look at the governor's, was it 48 billion dollar proposal uh, that, you know, he made earlier this year. How much of that ends up being enacted, we'll have to see at this point. Uh, the legislature's still going back and forth, basically the Senate Republicans and the House Democrats trying to figure figure out not exact, you know, not only uh, how much money is gonna be appropriated, but also what measures are gonna get appropriated. The big sticking point this year, high uh, education, public education, the, the state's legislature. That, that often is the, <laughs> is the case, right, yeah, Jan? Yeah, and I mean, like, I'm, I'm hearing reports that it's, you know, our current budget is 45 billion, the governor wanted 48. I'm hearing it's gonna probably be in, like, the $47 billion but range. But here's the point. It's not like the state has a deficit. The state has a budget surplus, right. so it's spending it's, money. It's not debating raising taxes, correct? That, that's right. In fact, I'm hearing that there's a, a good chance there's going to be a tax cut of some sort a tax in, cut. The, in this budget plan. But um, yeah, the state is, is running. It's about $15 billion between our rainy day fund and our budget budgetary uh, reserves. But, um, you know, the problem is, is that revenues only raise like 45 billion or that's what the anticipation is. So we're going to have to dip into our savings account to fund this budget. And that, that that's where the, <laughs> the sure. rub is, yeah, that, sure. you know, yeah. they don't want to go down the line spending, overspending this. And I know, get it, given my history of following these for many, many uh, years, it's no surprise that the budget isn't done by the end of the fiscal right. year. Right. I think it rarely is. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, when you look at the, the legislature in this process, not only is it uh, a situation where they're trying to pass the budget, they're also trying to figure out what other legislation yeah. to pass. There's a lot of bills out there uh, that, that remain out there, skill games, uh, some of the other marijuana. Some, uh, right. marijuana. There's a lot of issues out there that, that remain. All right, a lot of folks are interested in the next topic. It's called expanding happy hour. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, it's an idea that uh, has been put forth, and and I think you know the the governor's office said he would sign this bill, and it it doesn't just exclusively deal with happy hour, but it has a number of liquor law changes. But what it would do is a few right, things like that. Yeah, well, the the one thing that um, it does is right now happy hour is limited to 14 hours a week. I, I think a lot of Pennsylvanians don't realize that there's a, a law that like limits how long happy hours can be, but this would expand it to 24 hours a week. So that. The idea is to be able to draw more patrons into restaurants and bars. And, um, and happy this, hour translates into uh, cheap drinks. Is cheap that drinks. Cheaper, cheaper, cheaper drinks. drinks and I then they say. stay around after they had a few drinks and maybe get a meal or whatever. And then another part of this is it um, introduces the idea of value meals, like you get at McDonald's. Only along as part of the deal, you get a dis, you know, you get a drink, you get an adult beverage with your. And so restaurants and bars would be able to offer those kind of meal, you know, meal combos. And the um, the third thing that it does that I think people might be interested in is a bar could throw a Super Bowl party and the cost of the ticket right. could include up to two drinks, adult drinks. Yeah. And um, oh so I, it's, it's all about, you know, helping our restaurants Restaurant and bars recover bars, from yeah. the pandemic. That they're, they're What's still going suffering. to happen with it? Uh, I think that remains to be seen. I think as <laughs> the legislature works in mysterious, uh, some would say unproductive ways at times, but the 
bottom line is uh, unpredictable too. Yeah, right? that's that's for sure. I think the biggest thing Terry is going to be: Are they able to, you know, include some of these measures like the happy hour, like perhaps even the uh, school cell phone ban? into either the bills that the you know the fiscal code some of those other bills like the school code do they actually get passed uh, as part of those right. measures do they get passed as standalone bills Main okay we have about a minute left private school tax credits well that's something that um the uh, senate committee was considering this week i mean since vouchers uh, all reports say that's not part of this budget deal this year and uh, so now just another way to help people that kids have kids that go to private schools this idea is to give parents a six thousand dollar tax credit you know to cover their their tuition you know the cost that they incur out of pocket for sending their kids to private school but it, anything yes. to add well I, I think it's might be the compromise between not getting vouchers in yeah. the budget this year for for the Senate Republicans all right, well, this was a very, very important update. Now we're going to turn to Pennsylvania's energy dilemma. As everybody knows, we're a big energy producer. Do we have a dilemma? We're going to find out. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Cross State Credit Union Association. Credit unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, go to ibelong.org and by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Association of Pennsylvania State College and University Faculties representing the faculty and coaches who are devoted to providing quality public higher education for Pennsylvania's college students. Well, the big topic, does Pennsylvania have an energy dilemma? To talk about that and more subjects dealing with uh, energy is Terry Fitzpatrick. He's the president of the Energy Association of Pennsylvania. Terry, welcome back. Thank you. All right. Well, w when I got what you call Pennsylvania's energy dilemma, I'm thinking, we have a large, complicated, energy-producing state. Am I right about that? Absolutely. One, one of the biggest in, in the country, as a matter of fact, yes. Well, and, we, and a long history, too, of producing energy. Yeah, talk a little bit about that history and what energy we produce. Yeah, it goes all the way back to drilling, you know, the first oil well in Titusville. The, you know, our, our history with the coal, of, of mining coal. Mining My ancestors, coal. I'm, I'm here because of coal. Hard and soft coal? Yes, hard and soft coal. I'm from the anthracite region, but the uh, bituminous That's region's up very big. in the northeast, big. up in— I always relate hard coal with Scranton, Correct. whether I should do that or not, it's another question. Scranton and Pottsville, yes. And Pottsville. Um, so, yes, that we have that long history of producing oil and coal, and more recently, of course, in the past decade and a half, the emergence of the Marcella Shale natural gas formation and the fact that Pennsylvania, unlike some surrounding states, has tapped into that. And we're now the second largest natural gas producing state yeah. in the country. An amazing, amazing turnaround with regard to our yeah. development of that. All right. I promoted it at the outset of this uh, particularly <clears throat> part of the program, Pennsylvania's energy dilemma. What's our dilemma? Yes. The dilemma is that uh, we, we're part of a regional grid, um, 13 states in the, in the District of Columbia called PJM. Uh, PJM put out a report uh, a little over a year ago that said, uh, according to their forecast, under present trends, it looks like by the years 2028 to 2030, we may not have enough generation, uh, electric generation, to meet the load in the area. Uh, and the reason is that for that— in our state? Uh, that's within the whole PJM region, the entire PJM region. Okay. Because, you know, it doesn't—electricity flows, it doesn't respect state boundaries. We're part of this oh, region. Oh, absolutely. Part of this regional grid. Um, the reason for that is that the baseload coal and natural gas plants are retiring prematurely um, because of state and federal policies, environmental policies. And that consists of both policies giving preferences to renewable energy, as well as some specific state policies. Illinois, for example, passed a law that mandates the closure of coal and natural gas plants 
Um, and then federal environmental rules are encouraging the closure of these plants. PJM saying that's happening too quickly. We're concerned we're not going to be able to keep the lights on in five years. Um, and so that, that's the dilemma. The dilemma is Pennsylvania really hasn't done really isn't contributing uh, much, at, th at this point at least, to that problem. We have a renewable energy requirements, but they're pretty modest. We certainly have not mandated the closure of any plants. So we're going to be affected by this problem if it comes, and yet our policies aren't contributing to it. Yeah. So what does Pennsylvania do, or, you know, what's, what's the proper response? That's the dilemma here. And energy is still an important part of the Pennsylvania economy? Absolutely. It's critical, Terry. I mean, it's critical in itself for, for the employment, that it provides the economic growth. But then everybody, you know, all our business communities, as well as our all the residents of the state, of course, are very reliant on reliable energy. You can't have modern life without it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great point. Well, let's run to a break. When we come back, I'm going to talk about the markets in which ener energy gets distributed and how people react to that uh, soon. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine. broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania American Water. We keep life flowing across the Keystone State. Well, Terry Fitzpatrick is my guest. He's the president of the Energy Association of Pennsylvania. We're talking about Pennsylvania's energy dilemma. We're a huge producer of energy, as I think we all know. And we also have markets for that energy. And, Terry, there's problems with those markets at the current time. Uh, yes, there are, Terry. Uh, you know, back in 1996, Pennsylvania passed a law that um, what we call restructured the electric industry. Basically, it took electric utilities used to do everything. They used to own all of the infrastructure. They right. owned the, the distribution lines, the transmission lines, the generating plants. 1996, we made the decision that generating plant generation could be competitive, right. but you would still keep a monopoly on the distribution and, and transmission systems. But um, and, and at that time, the federal government set up wholesale electricity markets, too. So it really went the retail competition in Pennsylvania, wholesale competition at the federal, federal level. Both of those things went together. And a lot of other states joined that, too. New Jersey opened up their market. Maryland did. Ohio did. Delaware did. So you had these markets that were working. And the idea was to build power plants instead of the utility doing it and charging ratepayers. You would have competitive firms come in and build these power plants in response to market signals, because so, they thought they could make money doing and it. And so how does that break the markets? Well, it, it worked for a while. In fact, I recall testifying in Ohio about our policies in Pennsylvania back about 12 years ago, and I gave a lot of examples of natural gas plants that got built just in response to these market signals, so it worked. But about five years ago, all the investment in baseload plants, natural gas, basically, that all dried up because investors were looking at this and saying, well, you're giving all this money to renewables, all these preferences. At the same time, we're kind of being vilified and all these environmental laws are being passed. Right. We can't see that we can make money for sure 10, 20 years down the That's road. Point. So if you're not going to get your money back on your investment, you won't make it. So that, that investment has dried up. Yeah. You know, that's part of the dilemma. Everything now that's in the PJM interconnection queue consists of renewables and battery storage. Now, you have a point you make, and I'll quote exactly what you have, have said. Bad policies are digging a hole. Now, yes. I, I notice I like that digging a hole, given removing right. things from the ground like oil and, <laughs> and coal. Well, that's correct. And we're still we're still digging, you know, we're in, in most digging. of the country. Yes, we're still putting more preferences for renewables. Uh, EPA came out with rules that are going to make it virtually impossible to build a new natural gas plant right now. And the whole industry is saying that. 
And in Pennsylvania, we're, we're having a debate about some laws that would increase renewable energy requirements, that would also put a cap-and-trade program on existing power plants. Frankly, those things are just going to add to the headwinds that the generation industry is facing. Now, when um, you say a law, it's, it's, these are proposals in the state legislature? Yes, it, this is proposed legislation. There was a hearing on the uh, bill to increase renewable energy requirements in the House just last week. The problem is, though, we don't have a consensus in our society. I mean, environmental groups and folks on the progressive side of the political spectrum, they think the problem in Pennsylvania is that we don't have enough renewable energy. They, they look and say, well, we're not building as many of right. these, you know, solar arrays as neighboring states. That's a problem. Is, the, is, the irony is and we probably don't have as much of that, but the truth is we're not contributing to the problem that PJM has identified. Is the reason of that. that we haven't is that we have all this other form of energy that's a big part of the economy? That's, that's part of it, Terry. But really, Pennsylvania is more of a middle-of-the-road state. I mean, states like New Jersey and Maryland are much more progressive than us. Actually, our policies are somewhat similar to Ohio and West Virginia. Yeah. We have not right. gone all in and put a, for example, some states are saying we're going to get all renewable energy in 20 but, years. But we have we a lot of that. lawmakers who represent these industries. Yes. These places that produce this energy. Yes, and we have a divided political um, system. It, we're a purple state. The governor controls—we have a Democratic governor, a Democratic-controlled right. House, narrow, but democratically controlled. But we have a Republican Senate, so that tends to temper. Some people would say that's paralysis, but I would say, well, in some cases, that keeps bad ideas from getting, from getting enacted into law. Yeah. But what do you expect that's likely to happen in the legislature? Is it uh, a little, a lot? Uh... On the energy, in the energy field, Terry, I don't think you're going to see a whole lot, because the debate that's playing out is Democrats are tending to push climate-related policies and push renewable energy. Right. Republicans are pushing back and saying they're, they're, they're making the point about reliability and also about affordability. Now, there's compromises that can be made there. but. The, frankly, the environment isn't very ripe for those compromises right now. And, of course, you still have the litigation over, over the plan for Pennsylvania to join REGI, a regional cap-and-trade um, Stop digging. Association. <laughs> well, yes. Yes. Well, that's, that's in the courts, um, and uh, you know, it's before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and we'll have to see how they rule on that. Yeah. I mean, the fact of the matter is that— when you have so many areas that produce energy and so many people who work in those industries, and then you have lawmakers who represent those people, it, it, it's not an easy environment to discuss almost any kind of change, is it? Uh, cha change is hard. I, I would say in this area, though, with some of these policies, Terry, I, I think it's, it's good that we be deliberate about it. You know, and I, I respect the opinions of the folks who, who disagree with some of the things I'm saying here. They, they need to be heard, too. But we need to have a realistic view of how much change is possible in our right. energy system and what we need to keep the lights on down the road. Yeah. We should not hurt ourselves with these policies. Well, look, thanks for coming on. This is an important update. All right. Uh, see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And as always, stay well.